Ladies and gents, welcome to Next Level Radio. I am your host, Colby Wartman, and our mission is to tackle the biggest questions in strength and conditioning, business, investing, and everything in between. We bring to you the best people in every sector so that you, the listener, can benefit and learn from the best in the biz. Whether that is S&C or business, you can rest assured you're getting the best knowledge available. Having trained athletes for many, many years, we have tried every treadmill known to man. You name it, we've tried it. With these treadmills, there's always been a disconnect, something missing for our athletic performance, something that just does not correlate to athletic success on the field until we tried our true form runners. True form for over 10 years has been elevating the performance of pro athletes, college athletes, recreational runners, and everyday athletes alike. You can check out Trueform Treadmills at trueformrunner.com, and we thank Trueform for being a, an exclusive sponsor of Next Level Radio. All right, it's time we all grow up a little bit. Ditch the pre-workout. It's not 2007 anymore, and it's nothing like Jack 3D. Ditch the shaker. You're not four years old, and you don't need a bottle anymore. And get yourself the best dippable pre-workout on the market. Each pouch is patriotically packed with 300 milligrams of caffeine and vitamins because shaker bottles suck. Send It Subs is the -the on-the-go solution for athletes, LEOs, firefighters, door kickers, and everybody in between. Head over to SendItSups.com to get the best dippable pre-workout on the market and we thank Send It Subs for being a sponsor of Next Level Radio. Next Level Radio continues to grow because of our listeners and our sponsors. Today, we present you Fat Fish Brewing, the official beer of Next Level Radio. Whether you're looking for a night out with family or smashing the best craft beers in the area, you will find it all at Fat Fish Brewing. Check out Fat Fish on the Large Street in Dickinson or check them out on their website at fatfishbrewing.com. Life has an amazing way of coming full circle and bringing to you the people that you need in your life at that time. As a young whippersnapper, four monsters deep, just excited to tackle the day, I'm headed to my first strength and conditioning conference and I hear about a company called Team Builder. Multiple coaches with experience with Team Builder and other platforms said the exact same thing. They said that you can get very similar products across different platforms. However, the thing that truly sets aside Team Builder and puts their product above anybody else's is their true and genuine customer service. As a customer for many years, both at the university setting and the private facility, I can tell you, Team Builder's customer service is absolutely second to none. Late night emails, programming issues, emergencies on my end are all resolved very, very quickly. So join the thousands of universities and private facilities that use Team Builder to elevate their businesses by going to teambuilder.com, click start my free trial and use code NLT at checkout. Our next sponsor, Nutridyne, a medical supplement company aimed at enhancing performance and addressing the underlying issues of disease. You will be hard-pressed to find the quality that you'll find at Nutridyne. Listeners of this podcast get 20% off all supplements. Just go to at coach underscore Wartman and click the Nutridyne link in our bio. Keep up with us on Instagram at coach underscore Wartman on our website, nl-training.com or keep up with us on the next episode of Next Level Radio. Now sit back, relax, and take in the mind-melting knowledge of this episode. Ladies and gents, we are live with episode number 116 of Next Level Radio. And if it sounds a little bit different, it's because it's a little bit different. I am actually on the road back from the greatest state in the union, the Cowboy State, the old 307, Wyoming, on my way back to North Dakota. I would say the second, but third, okay, fourth best state 
in the union, okay? So we got number one, Wyoming, number two, Montana, number three, South Dakota, and number four, North Dakota. Sorry, Minnesota, you won't even be on the top 49 list, sorry. But I, for you guys that don't know, I was able to, I was lucky enough, and God willing, I was able to draw a Wyoming elk tag. And for all my buddies in North Dakota that don't know, um, and they grew up with the normal of one elk tag license per lifetime, which is absolutely crazy. In Wyoming, in Montana, you can get elk tags and multiple elk tags at that every single year. And it's, it's an amazing, an amazing thing that we can do and harvest these beautiful animals every single year and multiple a year if you're lucky. And so for the people that are very close to me, otherwise you wouldn't know, but I was able to go down to Wyoming and we had a plan of getting a podcast done with my father and we were able to get some audio. However, the audio quality is not the best. Um, and so we were going to be detailing this amazing hunt and trip and safari that we were able to go on as it was one that I will always, always remember. Um, some of the best and most fond memories that I have in my life are revolved around hunting. Uh, the harvesting of the animal, the work it does, the work it takes just to get there, just to set up, get in the position to do the thing that we love most and harvest these beautiful animals and bring them back to our families and uh, be able to feed our families is a feeling unlike any other. And so this podcast episode is pretty special and we have been planning this for a long time on this trip and wanted to make it a very, very special event for you guys. And hopefully you guys can take these memories and take these lessons and take these skills and experience and learn. And hopefully um, if you aren't a hunter, it can intrigue you into the wonderful, fruitful world and unforgiving world of hunting. And if you are a hunter, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. And so this year was the first year, actually, that I put in for Wyoming elk tag. I'm just sick and tired of not getting an elk tag in North Dakota. Um, North Dakota has amazing, beautiful animals such as deer, moose, elk, but they are much further and few between. Uh, so I put in this year, I have um, some very, very close family friends. As you guys know, every, every dad, every family has that, uh, that guy that they call Uncle Joe, Uncle Buck, Uncle Bob. And there's no relation. You have zero relation to these people, but uh, your whole life you grew up with them and that is Uncle Bob. Well, I have Uncle Dean, and this is my dad's best friend growing up. They uh, played softball together for many, many years, very very competitively and at a very high level. And um, he lives in Rollins, Wyoming, and we've we've hunted with him since since I can remember, since I was shitting in my britches. And we he lives in Rollins, Wyoming, and we've had uh, 108 type, or, or excuse me, 108 bull tags, 108 cow tags, and then recently, in the last two years, my Uncle Dean has purchased um, a good slew of acreage over by 118, the Elk Area 118. So you are just west of Rollins, in between Rollins and Wampsetter, Wyoming. Um, it's a very small oil field area, desert area, that uh, resembles the Bakken um, at a much smaller scale. and. The crazy part is, is you go from this mountainous area and 99% of the time, many people think of elk hunting as these big pines, these mountainous areas, this place where these rugged animals can live and breed and, and go about their lives, right? Well, over on this side of the state in the, in the specifically in 118 is this desert, um, rolling hills with deep ravines, um, every couple miles that these elk can really disappear in and this desert land is super unforgiving it's super rough but it's not the Bighorn Mountains it's not the Rocky Mountains it's not something where we're hiking all day long and hiking in and packing out and all that but this land is super unforgiving and super um, you would not expect the size and volume 
of elk that are in this area. They come off those mountains that are just south of Rollins, they cross the freeway, they cross the interstate, and they're in 118 with a lot less pressure as they're not putting that many tags out in this area compared to the mountains uh, just south of town over by Saratoga. And honestly, this was one of the most uh, memorable hunts that I've ever had, and uh, I hope you guys can enjoy and listen to this story as uh, something that you guys can learn from. But I was able to come down, uh, got everything secured at the at, in Dickinson, and we went down on a Friday, got there for in time for um, setting up camp and all that in the evening. It's about an eight hour drive from Dickinson to Rollins. And uh, we pushed back our closing date for our duplex um, to this coming week so that we could uh, make this hunting trip really, really work out. And uh, all the memories that come along with hunting usually wrap around two things. Number one, the people that you're sharing it with. And number two, the harvesting of that animal, okay? And the harvesting of that animal is only one very, very important, but small portion of the pie, right? And these memories that you get to spend with these individuals and uh, the food and, the, and the, the stories that you can create with these last a lifetime. And now that I'm a father, these will last past my lifetime as Ridgeman will get to hunt with me and uh, do the things that I love and hopefully that he loves. So I was able to come down on a Friday and get to cascade across this beautiful state that I was uh, lucky enough to be born into. And we got down Friday, we set up camp, and Saturday morning, my father and I, just us as uh, the, the uncle and cousins, quote unquote, were not out yet. So they were coming out for the evening hunt. And for most people that don't know, um, you usually do really, really early morning hunts and then you do evening hunts with big game animals as they are up and at them in the morning, moving around um, they, after being bedded down all night. And then what they'll do in during midday is they usually will bed down and just stay put unless very, very provoked and pushed. And so you usually do a good early morning hunt. You come back, you have your breakfast slash lunch, you get every, take care of everything that you need to take care of, and then you go out on an evening hunt until the shooting light is gone. And so my father and I, we go out um, into the area 118 and we're hunting by ourselves and we do not see one elk. Jesus Christ. Holy moly. That guy just about got hit in the interstate. But um, we go out and we see absolutely nothing. Again, this land is super, super weird and unforgiving, right? And from there, um, we come back in and obviously a little bit distraught and we are getting ready to pull back into our camp. And as we pull back into camp, I get a call from Uncle Dean on the radio like, dudes, haul ass, we got a big herd of elk. And I think there was just under 100, so it's not a massive herd. but within a quarter mile of our campers, of our camp. And uh, this herd has been sitting there all year round and they stay within about a two to three square mile and they just filter back and forth, back and forth through these ravines. And in this hunting area, there's not a ton of tags given. It's a very exclusive area. And so with that, they do not have a lot of pressure but also with that, as I told you, this is in the middle of a very, very small oil field. And so with the oil field comes a lots of traffic and with lots of traffic comes lots of people and with lots of traffic and people comes the desensitization of these elk. And so they see vehicles all day long. These, these elk do not spook on these vehicles. However, when individuals get out of their vehicles, whether it's oil field or hunters, that is what spooks these elk. And so we pull up and there's a massive herd of elk just off the side of the road and just for context my father and i we my father has two elk tags and they're both cows i had a cow tag and then the cousins um, and the uncle so the oldest one garrett he has a bull tag and my uncle dean has a bull tag as well and these are very very successful hunters they have uh, many many great great bulls in their portfolio you could call it and so as we pull up, it, the decision is this, um, do we take shots, take down these cows and risk spooking this elk out of the area 
um, as there was about a 340 class bull that Garrett was really wanting to get after. And uh, that's, that's kind of our decision we have to make. And long story short, Garrett decided that's the bull that he wants. And so we leave this, we leave this crew alone. And if I'm going to be completely honest, like that's a, that sucks, right? That for us, we're, we're not, we're not getting in it for the horns because we have cow tags. We're just trying to get some meat and fill the freezer. And, um, but from what we've seen with the game cameras that this is going to be a a very plentiful hunt and, uh, there's a ton of actual elk in this area. It's just hard because you never, ever know with elk hunting. Um, you could see something, um, you could see nothing all day or you could be in herds of elk like crazy and so luckily enough we were able to see some after this but we leave these bulls alone as bull season only opens on sunday and today is saturday so we end up going back eating some of the best food ever i mean i'm telling you guys everything tastes better at elk camp um whether it's burgers and fries burgers and baked beans and potatoes whether it's steak whether it's spaghetti whatever it is it always just that there's something to it there's something to the old pans that weren't washed good enough and have a little bit of extra food in them or the the fire that it's cooked on or just the person and their hands that are prepping it man i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of primal instinct behind that, but it's just an experience as a whole, and it's uh, something that you have to you have to try. Um, you could be eating the most generic, crappy hamburgers, and they taste amazing because of the work you've done, the time you've put in, and everything that you've put forth to this hunt. Just makes the experience way better, and uh, it's not a placebo effect. I can tell you that right now. And so we end up having a very, very memorable, great conversation lunch, and uh, we end up getting back on the road and back out into our area so that we can uh, start getting after these elk. Well, we decide to go to a little bit different portion of 118, and I'm not going to give you the secrets right away, um, but we end up going out there and we get on another herd of about 30 to 50 uh, head of elk. And we get out to a point, we walk about a quarter mile, and we're just at like 1800 yards from these uh from these elk and we see them and they're just very very slowly um meandering as they they're really not spooked by anything and so they're slowly meandering to this uh this main road and so the goal and the objective is to cut them off and hopefully get some shots off well uh as these elk are slowly meandering we start to slowly creep on this main oil filled road and um we come up on them and they're about 500 600 yards away and at that point that's a with the rifle i'm shooting i'm shooting a 300 prc um very very high intensity caliber um well known uh in the long range game and uh holds very very highly on the ranks in the record boards for the longest shot ever with a with a bolt action rifle and I mean, these things can reach out to 2,000 yards. Um, there's people that have shot these out to multiple miles, uh, m- a mile, mile and a half. And so these are, uh, these are very, very high performance rifles and they are a great, great caliber. And as we pull up, um, we get out of the truck, get off the road, make sure everything's set up. We get everything, get prone, get on our shooting sticks, me and my father. And this is such a super, super cool moment um, that we get to share it together. And, uh, as we're going, we have about a 500, 550 yard shot, and they start to crest this little this little ridge and go down into this ravine where we can't get to them. So we hop back in the truck, we blaze and haul ass up the road, maybe an eighth of a mile, um, call it 400 yards or so, and we get another good shot of this group. And they're not they're not stunned, they're not spooked, but they're moving because if you've ever been on on elk when they're moving good luck keeping up with them number one not even mention get a shot off those things are absolute units and they're athletes and uh they're such a freaking badass beautiful beautiful animal and so we get up and maybe 400 yards goes by we're paralleling these deer or these elk and we get out of the vehicle and now we have a better shot so we're about 440 450 yards from these elk and again my dad has a cow tag i have a cow tag and there is uh, a couple bulls in there and then some cows 
and I'm getting set up, getting ready. I'm shooting a suppressed 300 PRC, so the thing is very, very quiet. My dad's shooting a old trusty seven millimeter, which is a very good round that's making a good comeback in the long range shooting uh, area, but it's a very old rifle um, and it's trusty and it's, it's done very well. And so as I'm getting set up off, um, off the main beaten road there and uh, I'm getting every setup thing on the tripod and getting that uh, that that cow in my in my crosshairs. I hear that just freaking bang, and my dad takes a shot. And obviously, I'm in my scope. I can't see, and uh, I just hear hit um, over the radio. So my uncle Dean and the kiddos are right there with us, and we see um, one of the back cows start to take a nosedive. Uh, my dad took one shot at that 400, 450 yard um, shot, hit it right dead center, right behind the front shoulder, dropped it. Instant heart shot, um, the most ethical shot you can have on an elk, right? We, the, the, whole, the whole thing with hunting is mistakes can happen, right? It's a very intense moment. You are very, very on edge and it is my duty and it's the reason I train so hard and do the things that I do and put rounds down range and get the practice that I need to so that you can make 100% the best, most ethical shot possible. Mistakes happen and you have to make sure you mitigate those mistakes. However, um, taking the best shot possible and the most ethical shot possible is the number one objective for all very good and ethical hunters. So my dad did an amazing job, um, but just put it right behind the shoulder and just flop that thing down. And before we even knew that that cow was down, I had my cow in my crosshairs at about the 400, 450 yard mark. And um, with this 300 PRC, man, um, it's, it, it's a dream, right? But if you've ever been behind the crosshairs, and putting those crosshairs on a big game animal, whether that's a deer, an elk, a moose, a bear, whatever it is, you can you can never grasp that feeling, right? It, it, if I could put that feeling in a bottle and keep it on reserve, I would. This is something unlike anything other, right? So you pop out of this vehicle and no matter how many times you've done it, no matter how many rounds down range, you cannot control your heart rate. As soon as you see those beautiful, majestic, athletic elk, um, your heart rate just starts going through the roof. It starts pumping endorphins and all the adrenaline are dumping into your bloodstream and it's spiking your heart rate and you can't do anything about it. The only thing you can do is control the, control the variables you can control try to start breathing, bringing it back down. Um, but it, it is, it is a task in itself. And so I'm laying, I'm prone and all these freaking, all this adrenaline is just dumped into my system. You can't see straight. You can't think straight. You're just trying to make the best decisions with the time frame that you have as we only had five to 10 seconds before these elk were gone. And so I get this thing lined up at about 440, 41 yards is what my uh, rangefinder said once I pulled the trigger. And with this 300 PRC, I had it built by a really, really good buddy I played college football with, Jake Hardy. And Jake Hardy um, works with Rough Rider Gun Company and they built me in a majestic rifle, a very amazing rifle. But we put in a Trigger Tech Special Trigger. And this is a company out of Canada. And uh, this is a very, very light, light trigger. Luckily, I've had rounds down range. I've shot this gun a lot. Um, but this trigger is very, very light. And when you give it any go, as soon as you get on that trigger, it's going because the only time you put your finger on the trigger is when you're ready and ready to shoot. And so I just, there's not even a chance to really squeeze, guys. Um, if you've ever shot a real shitty rifle, an old Remington or a Winchester, and there's about freaking 20 pounds of pull on that, uh, on that trigger, this is a whole different ball game. And so as I'm getting it lined up in the crosshairs, I knew my rifle was dead on suppressed at 200 yards, dead on. 
So we, knowing we're over about 400, I have uh, about a half inch holdover and I have it just right on the heart, right on that shoulder blade. And as I pull the trigger, as I squeeze, goes off, very, very uh, suppressed round, very quiet. And uh, with this 300 PRC, it has a little bit of a kick to it. So it's hard to keep, uh, keep, keep your vision in the scope and see an impact or see anything that's happening. And uh, so all I do, I pull the trigger, I look up and I see, and I can start to think I'm seeing this thing wobble. And as soon as I think it's about to wobble, um, Uncle Dean and the kids say hit, and this thing topples over. Um, two very, very good cows, over 400 pounds, very big, old, old lead cows. And um, it was uh, an amazing harvest, but those, those amazingly placed shots are probably one of the most gratifying things you can do. Um, the training, the physical training, the rounds down range, all those things come into, come into the picture and it's very gratifying because um, as much as I love hunting, it's one of my favorite things to do, whether it's deer, pheasant, elk, whatever it is. Um, it is always, always, I'm a, I'm a big softy. It's always heartbreaking when the shot is not made that you want and this animal is suffering and you have to mediate that as soon as possible and so uh, luckily these were two very very well placed shots and uh, so both my dad and I get to fill our tags and our adrenaline's just going we're, we're hugging each other telling stories just doing all these things and it didn't take but five seconds after that shot for those things to expire and uh after that, we go up, um, we get them gutted, we get them field dressed, we put them away, and um, that feeling, that's when you kind of start thinking and feeling that feeling of, I just provided for my family, I can take this home, I can feed my family for a year on some of the best meat this world has to offer. And I told this story a while ago, but um, it's, it's, it's really surreal. Uh, so I've been married to my wife many years, and I've taken deer home, I've taken pheasant home, and we've put it in the freezer and fed ourselves for years and years to come. Um, but something changes when you become a father. Like, something really, really changes when you become a dad. Um, that primal instinct of providing and going and doing those things that uh, are very primal to our existence is unlike any other. Um, I can't explain it. I can't pinpoint where it's from, but um, it's very primal. It's within the DNA. Going out, sacrificing your time away from your family, sacrificing money, sacrificing work, sacrificing everything in your life for one sole purpose of providing food for your family um, is something that I will do the rest of my life, no doubt about it. And uh, harvesting those, and now it's such a different ball game taking that home for my child, right? Um, it's one thing taking it home for my wife and us eating it um, as the selfish act that I can do with harvesting this animal, but taking it home for Ridge and in the next year, two years, when he starts remembering these stories and hearing about these stories and then creating those memories for himself and then him having kids and creating those memories for him and his kids, um, it's, it's something that uh, I, I get emotional about, and it's something that I will do for the rest of my life, and I think it's something that everybody should and I wish could experience. Um, and as eventful as those, what, 10 hours of opening season were, um, I thought it was going to come to to an end. I mean, it's too good to be true. This is elk hunting. This, this shouldn't happen so quick. We have two elk dead in the matter of 10 hours. And in that, we, uh, we go home, we start cooking dinner and uh, telling the stories and hearing things about the, the elk of the past and the, the hunts of the past, both successful and unsuccessful. And uh, we eat dinner, we, we shoot the shit, have a few beers, and uh, then we go to bed. And at this point, um, it's something that you don't, you don't realize how amazing these memories are going to be until they're gone, right? Like, 
uh, the youth is wasted on the youth. Like we always look back and say like, man, those were the days, right? Um, but as we're creating those, that current reality we're in and the memories that we're gonna live for in the next 10 years are now. And once we got up the next morning, um, at this point, we now have a plan of attack. We know exactly where we're gonna get these elk. We know exactly because now this is opening morning, bull season. Let's time to, it's time to rock. Garrett needs his bull, Dean needs his bull, and my dad still needs another cow tag filled. And so we have a plan of attack instead of going out towards Continental Divide where we were at. Now we're staying home, we're staying closer to home, right where we saw those elk at that, uh, at that spot, just right up the road from our camp. And uh, if you've never, if you, you, you know, waking up for work and it's uh, for me waking up at 3.30 or 4.30, um, waking up for work, having to go, it's monotonous, it's hard and it's all that. Um, four o'clock rolls around when you're hunting elk and you're jumping out of bed. It's time to go. This is what we were made for, right? You're brewing the coffee, the cowboy coffee on the stove in the little tiny camper. Um, it couldn't get better than that. And so we head out early in the morning and we are just sitting black, just dark as all can be. And we're sitting waiting for these elk just over the ridge where we saw them. And sure shit, these elk have been there for years. They've stayed in the same two square miles and now it's time to rock. We see these elk, we see the 340 class bull that Garrett is wanting and um, now we're just trying to get on them. It's time to get on them and get rolling. And as the daylight comes up, we uh, kind of traverse around the backside of them because there's this massive ravine um, out in the desert where they can get lost in. As soon as you see them on the horizon, they dive into this ravine and they're gone. Your guess is as good as mine of where they can go. And so we traverse them and we see these elk and uh, we start pushing them in the direction of the highway, uh, which would be south. And we start kind of pushing them out and my dad and I are in a vehicle ahead and uh, kind of the, the pecking order is like my dad who has another uh, cow tag, he is not gonna take a shot into this herd and potentially spook this bull, this amazing trophy bull out of the herd and out of the area. And so the pecking order is Garrett and Dean and then my dad's additional cow tag. And uh, as we're going, um, we get ahead of Dean and them and we're able to cut these elk off. And there's about a 400 yard shot for Garrett to hit. And over, over this ravine, he's able to hit this 400 yard shot and um, hits it up in the, hot, in the front legs uh, of that elk in the front shoulder. And when I tell you that these elk are the most resilient, tough uh, animals in the entire world, you would not believe it. Um, if you're not putting it directly on the heart, directly in the head, somewhere where it's gonna be lights out instantly, the most ethical shot you can make, these things are resilient. And he hits a shot there and this thing still running with the herd. Um, he's the lead bull, he's, uh, he's, he's a monster. And as we're going, um, this bull then decides to bed down. He's starting to bleed out. Um, he's bedded down. And where we were at, I was within 100 yards of this bull. And all I see on the horizon as he's bedded down, as he's not dead yet, is I see him keep turning his head forward and back, forward and back, which leads me to know that this is not a fatal shot and he's still up because if it's a fatal shot, even though if they're not expired yet, they're going to lay their head down. Um, it's the end times. And having said that, I start creeping up um, and getting very close. So I get within 10 yards of this bull. And as Garrett gets over, this bull pops up and Garrett's able to do the final kill shot within 30 seconds of the original shot. Um, and this, this monster bull who has been alive for 10, 15, 20 years um, was able to um, expire and be something of a memory and something that the kids and I and everybody else will remember for the rest of our lives. And we, we honor that. Um, and it's gonna feed our families, their families. And we honor that bull um, for many, many, many years to come as it's just a majestic, it's a majestic animal. And uh, 
So within 16 hours, ladies and gentlemen, within about 16 to 18 hours in the beautiful state of Wyoming, we have three elk dead. And uh, it's something I'll never forget. It's something that um, I hope my kids enjoy. It's something that um, you just can't replicate it. You can't replicate it with anything. No drug in this world. And for many people that know me, like I struggled with drug addiction. I've done every drug in the book. You cannot replicate this feeling. There's no chance in the world. And uh, for anybody that's even on the fence, man, um, reach out. I would love to help. I would love to guide. I would love to lend memories and experiences about um, these epic, epic hunts. And uh, so now I am heading back to Dickinson. I am have a, uh, a, a cow elk in the back of my truck. I'm gonna have a full freezer of beef and elk and our family is going to be happy and healthy and eating the best meat in the world. And um, I'm telling you guys right now as I reflect on this hunt, as I um, am able to think about it and think about these memories that we're gonna share, um, you have to do it. The the memories, the the experience, the adrenaline dump, the skill behind it, the the harvesting of that animal, the respect of that animal, the the memory of that animal, every single time will never get old. It's something that will never get old. You'll never forget it. What you will forget is the days that you sat on the couch and the days you didn't do anything. Um, hunting is special. And I hope you guys have enjoyed these last two weeks of um, reflecting on these memories that you can create with family, friends, and people that you love. And uh, it's just, it's something so special. Um, but I can't, uh, I can't thank enough the good Lord above. I can't thank my family enough and everything that we've been able to do. It's been, um, it's been a long time coming, getting out here and spending time with my family and Going home with a full freezer or an empty freezer, it I don't give a shit. It's uh, being able to spend that time with my family and loved ones and share the memories and have a beer here and there and just decompress in this crazy, crazy-ass world that we live in. Um, the time this is recorded, we have the Israel war going on. We have Ukraine going on. We have Russia. Um, it's something that uh, you can decompress and get off the damn phones and quit listening to the news cycles and be able to uh, spend time with the the ones you love because life is too short. And I tell myself that every single day, but you don't realize it until it's gone. And you don't realize it until you, until you regret it. So um, that is episode 116, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I have videos of the fittest dad on earth coming out and we are actually going to be expanding our YouTube presence. Um, We have upgraded cameras. We have done everything um, that you need to do to really take it seriously. And um, that's what we're going to do. We're going to uh, be really putting forth a lot of effort and time into our YouTube to really expand it and um, give you guys a quality product that you guys can learn from and experience what we're doing on a daily basis, chasing this journey of being the fittest fucking dad on earth. That is episode 116. Peace.